During the first two million years of human existence, a sight like this was unimaginable. The soil was never hoed. There were no hoes. No plants were grown like these peanuts in West Africa. No yam mounds were constructed like these in Igbo land. No animals with shapes and temperaments like these existed. None of the earth's natural cover had been removed, as on these Congo hills. No opening had ever been cut into the forests, like this riverside clearing in Nigeria. In all that vast amount of time, there was not a road, nor a house, nor a book, nor a shop anywhere on the planet. None of the present religions existed. What set us on the path to where we are today was the adoption of a different way of obtaining food, different from that of our own ancestors and other species. This change began in several parts of the world, including Africa, between 10 and 5,000 years ago. 10,000 years when viewed against the preceding 2 million years of human existence is just a flicker of time away from the present. Then, for the first time, some humans began to obtain most of their greens and meat, not by gathering from the wild or hunting, but by raising plants from seeds or cuttings and by caring for animals which they had domesticated. By changing how we obtain our food, agriculture changed the number of us that can live. Had hunting and gathering remained our economy, only one out of every 1,200 people alive today could have been fed. Most of us would never have been born. This is because each small hunter-gatherer group required hundreds of square miles of the Earth's surface to gather from among all plants the tiny proportion that are edible and to hunt animals. But by clearing a relatively small patch of land of its inedible plant cover and by seeding this patch fully and only with edibles and by raising chosen wild animals from birth so they wouldn't run away and were bred to satisfy human needs rather than their own needs, people for the first time could obtain all their food locally. With less land required per person for survival, the same amount of land could now support more people humans began to become the most numerous large animal species on Earth. Not only did agriculture make possible an increase in the number of individuals able to experience life, it altered how we experience life. Because a farming family's food supply was not obtained by roaming over a vast area, but was raised at one place, people could expect to stay at one place year-round. It now made sense to put effort into constructing a permanent residence. After two million years of people sleeping in caves, rock shelters, and flimsy windbreaks, sturdy houses of a multitude of designs made from a variety of materials began to be erected.
Accompanying the newly built houses were granaries and bins to store food between harvests, many designed to prevent rats from tunneling in. The first villages now appeared. Investigators have been puzzled, not by the questions when and where agriculture began, but why agriculture began. As far as the when and where, there are many signs. A change in stone tool technology is one sign. Roughly faceted choppers like this made by hunter-gatherers, were adequate for penetrating tough hide and for breaking animal bone to get at marrow, but not for the tasks confronting farmers. Farmers needed to cut down trees in order to obtain house posts and fencing, and to clear space for gardens and fields. The smoother an axis surface, the less resistance from the wood to each stroke. The first appearance of such ground and polished Neolithic or New Stone Age tools in any area is taken as one sign of the transition to agriculture. Another sign are excavated remains of the first permanent dwellings even when these consist of nothing more than pieces of hut flooring smoothed to a cement-like consistency, together with some fire ashes which are datable. The first appearance of pottery is another sign of the transition to agriculture. Because of its weight and breakability, pottery is unsuitable for and unknown among nomadic hunter-gatherers. The beginnings of plant and animal domestication also leave signs. Domestication involves selecting through successive generations which seeds and which young animals are to be consumed and which are to be saved for replanting or breeding. The result shows up in the archaeological record. Domesticated plant seeds and domesticated animal bones are different from their wild ancestors because of repeated selection for characteristics like seed size or heaviness in some animals that satisfy human wants rather than the plant or animal's independent survival needs. Based on these forms of evidence, there is general agreement on when and where agriculture began within the last 10,000 years in Southwest and Southeast Asia, Central America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. But why did agriculture begin? Why would people shift to an economic system that required them to put in longer hours of work than their hunter-gatherer ancestors to obtain the same amount of food? and why people would choose to give up the mental stimulation and problem-solving life of the hunter to take on the dull and often back-breaking labor of the farmer.
Not only did hunter-gatherers need to work less and less hard for the same amount of food, but studies of Kalahari hunter-gatherers and neighboring farmers have shown the hunter-gatherers to be healthier. And during droughts, it was the cultivators who were more prone to famine. In view of these findings, it is not surprising that our ancestors remained hunter-gatherers for more than 99% of the time that people have walked on Earth. They had accumulated enough knowledge of plants and animals to have become farmers, yet they did not become farmers. Adding to the mystery of why agriculture began within the last 1% of human time, is that it then began almost simultaneously in several unconnected parts of the world. At least 38 different theories have been proposed to answer why agriculture began. Some are variations on the theme that hunter-gatherer populations eventually increased to the point that they began to crowd each other out so people then had no choice but find ways of making do with less land. Others do not see shortages due to crowding or drought as causing the shift to agriculture. Instead, they see agriculture rising out of conditions of abundance. After all, if hardship conditions prevailed, who would be the first to do the extra work of cultivating land? when it would be others who would benefit, because hunter-gatherers were obligated to share food. And why would some of the first plants to have been domesticated consist of gourds, chili peppers, and other condiments which have no food value, rather than staple foods? These investigators believe that land clearance, hoeing, and the other troublesome and labor-intensive tasks involved in domestication of plants, such as the grains, was first undertaken not to add to the food supply because grain seed heads were initially too small to yield sufficient volume to provide a staple food. The grains, they say, were raised occasionally for special purposes, like beer making consumed at feasts by hunter-gatherers who had plenty of other food that was easier to obtain. Only after successive selection and harvests did the seed heads become enlarged sufficiently to justify raising grains regularly as food staples, not just for occasional beer parties. And only then, according to this theory, did agriculture begin to replace hunting and gathering, and permanent settlement became possible. Still another attempt to explain why agriculture began, despite yielding for several thousand years a life of harder work and a poorer and less reliable diet, is drug addiction. The drugs are exorphins, compounds not occurring in past hunter-gatherer diets, nor in primate diets, but found in cereal grains and milk from domesticated animals. These compounds have been found on their own to produce effects similar to those produced by psychoactive drugs. They activate reward centers in the brain and induce withdrawal symptoms. Was cereal agriculture adopted not because of the food value of the grain primarily, but because of a chemical reward? There are more than 30 other theories. There is no clear understanding of why agriculture began. But it altered the life experience of all age groups. Hunter-gatherer children lived well into their teens, free of all tasks and responsibilities. But agricultural families, confronted with longer work hours and harder work, had to call on their children to assist. Children were expected to help with hoeing, 
and with the constant weeding. With fetching water and wood. Children watched sun up to sunset to see that no harm came to herds and flocks. They helped to look after younger siblings. They might serve as here with a parent, in sun and in wind, as scarecrows to keep hungry birds and animals away from the crops. Adults also experienced a different world, where disease might rot their crop, or rain clouds pass it by, or locusts arrive. What were adults to do when disaster left all granaries empty? There were no stores. What then? Wait for one's wife and children and elders to starve to death? But if strangers elsewhere were known to have full granaries and fat cattle, do nothing? Wars have often been started during the last 5,000 years for property that was not essential to the aggressor's survival. This kind of warfare has been facilitated because of the separation of decision-making from fighting. When in the early stages of agriculture the decision-makers were the fighters, the able-bodied men of the neighborhood, would attempts to take the property of others by force then have been risked for a purpose other than survival? There were no police, no armies, no deferments. Painful events happened. When a tree fell and killed a child during a storm, parents and neighbors quite understood how this tragic event happened. But why? A question we ask too. Was the conjunction of the storm, the falling tree and the child mere blind, unintended coincidence of no further meaning than if the tree had crushed dried leaves on the forest floor? Surely human beings were more important than that. Whatever happened to them must have been intended and brought about, if not by someone like themselves, then by a more knowing and powerful conscious being, unlike themselves. Communal calamities also were far too stressful to attribute to impersonal forces, for then they would be left feeling completely helpless. No, there must be a purposeful mind behind their afflictions, a mind with whom it should be possible to engage. Here, people went to engage with the unseen. This tree was another place of encounter. Here was another. 
shrines were erected to shelter offerings here for the health of a village, for the protection of crops, a modest shrine to shelter offerings for the protection of a family's rice crop. Here, as seen through a dwelling's entrance, a shrine beside a family's millet patch. Here, a shrine made by a family that was going through a period of misfortune. A West African family paying their respects. The caption on this photo reads, Medicine man applying a fetish spirit on behalf of a woman with sick children at village on Pra River, 1901. In other words, people trying to cope. Sometimes people felt better going to someone reputed to be better able to explain what one's troubles were really about and what might be done about them. Someone reputed to have good insight into the working of the unseen. A practitioner applying lightning medicine to a baby and to a mother. With people now living on the constant edge of disaster, dependent on limited pastures for their herds or flocks, or on a heavily worked plot of land around which were other plots and many more people to have to deal with than had been true for hunter-gatherers in their small isolated groups. More tension, more conflict, more violence was to be expected. Indeed, theft began with agriculture. For the first time, people had property beyond what they wore and carried, including animals, stored foods, and many new kinds of objects. Farmers have been described sitting night-long watch over their gardens at harvest time to ensure that neighbors did not steal from the crop. They had to watch over their animals. There were as yet no chiefs, no police or prisons. African villagers and herders saw that they needed to work out an entire body of new rules to encourage essential cooperation and to mitigate conflict. Rules were now developed that had not been required during the previous two million years. Rules to identify heirs and provide for the distribution of property among them. Rules to define responsibilities for young and old, male and female, so clearly as to lessen the occasions for dispute. Rules for marriage and divorce and the custody of children. Rules for establishing a justice system for juries and verdicts and punishments, even in the absence of police and prisons. Because there was no money and no hired help, when assistance was needed, whether for home building or military service, rules were developed to determine who should provide it. Then there were rules for making rules, constitutions, albeit unwritten constitutions. Usually, the rulemaking bodies were the senior males of each extended family meeting in council. An open air council house in the northern savannas. General agreement was sought, never majority rule by vote to avoid an aggrieved minority within a very small community. Also new were now formal rules for instructing the young. Boys and girls went to schools where they were initiated formally into their adult responsibilities. These schools did not have brick walls. 
but attendance was required. Especially important was the rule, adopted throughout much of the continent, that people should find their marriage partners from outside their own lineage or clan. This helped to mitigate conflict. It meant that in disputes between clans, there would be calming voices. How successful were pioneer African agriculturalists in dampening the new flashpoints that emerged with the coming of agriculture? The fact that approximately 1,500 distinct African languages survived until modern times may offer a clue. For this suggests that relatively small farming and herding communities managed to elaborate their own cultures for long stretches of time without having to experience subordination to strangers. By way of contrast, the languages of Europe are far fewer and, with rare exceptions, are the languages of invading groups. How humans got along with each other when they now own property and could lose it to others was not the only new question requiring solutions. As the number of cultivators and herders increased, crowding of the home areas compelled some people to move. The general direction of movement was southward. Movement southward meant encountering new problems. Wheat, which had been grown in the northeast, became sickly in the semi-arid plains below the Sahara. The discussions which then must have taken place are lost to history. The solution is known. Wild grains, millet and sorghum, which were more comfortable in this environment, were domesticated. Later, offshoots of these people entered the rainforests. Here was too much water. No grains would grow. Also, insect-borne diseases made cattle keeping impossible. Yet the problems even of rainforest agriculture were solved. Yams and other root plants and vegetables replace the grains of staples. One rainforest plant domesticated in Africa 5,000 years ago is the oil palm, now by far the most important fruit crop in the world in terms of production, double that of the banana.
a geographer has listed some of the oil palm's more traditional uses in Africa. Women in Sierra Leone separating the kernels from the oil in a canoe, in a palm oil pit. Akinola Laseken's painting of Nigerian villagers processing palm oil products. The man at the left is drinking one of the products, palm wine. Unlike their hunter-gatherer forebears, African herders of the plains had to provide water for animals. In times much more ancient than the earlier 20th century, when these photographs were taken of Maasai watering their cattle, these deep wells in Tanzania and the stepped cattle walkways down to them were dug out by people whose names have been forgotten. The absence of surface water on these plains and rainfall that was both minimal and unreliable meant that growing plants for food was not an option for these herders. They dealt with the problem by adopting a diet in which milk, fresh and curdled, constituted 80% of their food, and cattle blood, most of the rest. So as not to diminish the milk supply, cattle were killed for their meat only on ceremonial occasions. For reasons still unknown, these people have half the cholesterol count of the average American, despite consuming twice as much animal fat. A blocked arrow is shot into a vein. and the blood drawn into a gourd. No harm befalls the animal which is ready to have blood drawn safely after a month. Because domestic animals were the principal food source of herding peoples, the health of their animals was the key to their own health. Herders, such as the West African Fulani, pictured here, have gained an even better understanding of cattle diseases than of human diseases because of their dissection of diseased animals after death. Examination of internal organs enabled them, in the case of parasitic infections, to identify the organ infected and the parasite responsible. In Ghana, a decoction of two plants used traditionally to cure guinea worm infestation is now accepted as the best treatment for the disease. But veterinary practices develop throughout Africa. Among subtle farmers, women who cared for chickens became their veterinarians. 
Men were the pharmacists for sheep and goats. But the methods of science, experimentation, observation, and inference are old, undoubtedly older even than agriculture. A great body of knowledge was inherited and added to, without which African agriculturalists could not have expanded throughout a continent of great challenges of climates and diseases. But the coming of agriculture and settled life, the second major change in the African past, after the evolution of humans themselves, was not the last. Ahead was a journey from communities of equals to large societies headed by an alpha male, chieftaincies, kingdoms, empires, civilizations. Here, the many would be subordinated to the will of the few. But the larger societies that were to come also made it possible, as agriculture itself had done, for more people to experience life itself. But this is another story. Thank you.